In 2022, Forbes published an article titled, Did COVID Kill Company Culture? In 2023, almost every tech company I know is struggling with this question of how to maintain corporate culture in a world where the workforce is way more virtual. Today, we will be tackling this tricky topic of corporate culture head on by picking the brain of Jessica Kriegel, the chief scientist at a company named Culture Partners. Yes, you heard that correctly, chief scientist. I'm Tom Slaw, the executive director of the Technology and Services Industry Association, and welcome to Tectonic, the podcast where we explore what makes technology business models successful in today's world. So let's get this insight engine humming. Jessica, welcome to Tectonic. And let's start here. Can you describe your role as chief scientist at Culture Partners? Absolutely. Uh, I get to research what works and what doesn't work in driving results for businesses along the lines of workplace culture. So I partner with various research institutions, most recently Stanford University, to identify what is correlated with revenue growth when it comes to the people in organizations. And we've had some really incredible insights come from that research. I also get to share that research broadly. So I am speaking to the media. I do keynote addresses regularly. And all of those uh, conversations that I get to have with various people are enriched with the data that I learn from. So it drives the work that we do with our clients. And it's just a passion of mine. Awesome. You're speaking our language here at TSIA, which is making business decisions based on data, right? And not just uh, intuition. So that is super cool. So data-driven assessment of corporate culture, right? Let's click into that. And so when you look at that, this path of using hard data to actually assess corporate culture, what kind of data are we talking about? What are you looking at? We're looking at broadly many different organizations across industries to see what works to drive results and what doesn't. So most recently, we did some research with 243 organizations. Big ones like McDonald's were in there, Hormel. I mean, some of the organizations we were studying had 350,000 employees and more mid-market organizations. We looked at their strategy, we looked at their purpose, we looked at their culture, and we looked at their revenue over the course of three years to see what really drove results, what was significantly correlated with differentiating between their competitors and the other organizations in that group. And what we found, not surprising to me, but maybe surprising to some of the listeners that you have, is that those with strong culture drove the most significant growth, much more than those with great strategy and much more than those with a clear purpose. Culture was the driver of revenue growth over the course of three years to the tune of 4X. I mean, companies that had strong culture had 4X more revenue growth than those with weak culture. So culture is the way. So I really want to understand when we say the term culture and we say we're, you know, strong culture versus weak culture, what do you start to look at there to test for the culture is actually strong, right? What are attributes the company can zero in on? Great question. So it's different if we're working with a client and if we're doing research. Those are two different questions. When we're working with a client, culture is measured by their results. If they achieve their results, they've got a strong culture because we've designed their culture around the results that they are hoping to achieve. And if they don't achieve their results, then their culture is not working for them. It's not about whether people are happy. And that's what a lot of engagement surveys identify. And it fails to actually make a difference in the business if people are happy, but they're not executing accordingly. So we measure culture by results with our clients. When we're doing research, however, we're trying to identify what in particular drove those results. So we can't measure culture with results. So we measure it by the way that people think and act. That's the simplest definition of culture that we have and and that resonates with all of the leaders we work with. It's how people think and act to get results. The way people think and act is aligned with strategy and aligned with purpose. You get certain results. And when they're not, you get other results. So I'm going to throw a question at you because I can imagine as you talk to leadership teams and you're starting a conversation about how important culture is to ultimate success, that a starting point often would be, I can just see a a CEO or the head of human resources saying, oh, our company, we've got a great culture. That's their starting point, right? We've got a great culture. And so if somebody just throws that on the table 
in that assertion, what is your typical reaction? Like, how do you move them off of that sort of blanket statement and just that assertion that our culture is great? Who doesn't think they have a great culture? Well, I'll agree with them. I said, I'm sure you do have a great culture. Your culture is perfectly aligned to the results that you're getting today. That's what your culture is. And we're not the kind of culture consulting firm, culture partners isn't, where we come in and we figure out, oh, well, here's all the things that are wrong with your culture that you need to fix. That's yeah, those, yeah. Are, those are consultants that come in, they're trying to kick up problems in order to upsell more services later. So they'll come yeah. in and they'll do a bunch of interviews and say, what makes you unhappy? What isn't working? What needs to be fixed, right? And then they right. present this list to the executive team of all of the challenges that they've been told and say, this is what you need to fix and here's the cost, right? We don't do that. Yep. We start by identifying the results that you want to achieve. And those results are how we're going to align your culture. We're not going to spend a bunch of time trying to figure out what you people think are wrong with your culture. And in order to achieve transformative results, next level results, which literally every company is trying to do right now, whether that be in the form of growth, accelerating, scaling, whether it be in the form of adjusting to a massive change in the industry, supply chain mm -hmm. issues, AI, working from home, whatever that dynamic may be, if you're trying to get new results in new conditions and adapt accordingly, that's what we're expert in. And we come in and say, what are you trying to achieve? We're going to help you create the culture that will align to those results, not the ones you're getting today. Wow, this is a really cool conversation. I love this because let me play back what I'm hearing, right? So I think the vast majority of people, when they hear the word culture, it is synonymous with things like, hey, people are happy. They feel like they're listened to. I mean, there's certain attributes I think people say, oh, that's a good corporate culture, right? That people really, quote, like to work there. And I want to test this with you. But what I heard is you say, no, culture is about, is it aligned with what you're trying to achieve as, as, as a business? So let's just you know have a scenario with company A, where they're doing a hard pivot in the market, maybe with their business model, they got to move super fast. They've made this decision and it is all about executing really quickly. And so a culture where everybody is going to weigh in and say, I, I feel really hurt and I want to weigh in on the strategy. It's like, we don't have time for that. That's not what success is for us right now. We're making this hard pivot. Everybody's got to be rowing real hard. The culture is execute right now. That culture right? Just basically get in line and move would be aligned with what they needed to achieve as a business. And so what you're saying is that's success, right? Absolutely. Not, you know, right. I, okay. When you think about culture, the way you describe just to make people happy, you can't make everyone yeah. happy because everyone is different right. and everyone wants different things. And, and what leaders will do is they'll throw solutions at culture that don't work to change any yeah. business results, certainly. And they don't even necessarily make people happy, like ping pong tables yeah. in the lobby, Right or free coffee or happy hours on Thursdays or you bring your dog to work day, you know, the list goes on ad nauseum, right? None of those yep. things change culture. They're fun perks. They may be interesting for a moment or two. A leadership retreat is a common culture fixer tool. We got to get yep. everyone together for three days and we're going to do our strengths finder or Myers-Briggs. That changes people's feelings for a few days. I would say there's a three-day leadership retreat high that lasts. And then on Monday, everyone <laughs> goes back to the way that it was. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. not culture. And that's one of the fundamental challenges and why I consider myself an evangelist of culture is that, first of all, we have to agree on what culture is. It's the way we think and act to get results. And if we can agree around that, then we can activate it. Many companies are good at memorializing culture. They'll write down a mission statement, various values. They have yeah. some strategic anchors that they may be trying to rally behind. And, and then they put it on a slide and it's memorialized. And it's a good idea, but they don't know how to operationalize it at scale. Yeah. And that's what we're expert in. That's what we help our clients with. Yeah, I'm finding this conversation super interesting and in, in this sort of recasting of what culture is. And one of the things that you created was this thing called the culture equation. So can you define that for the audience here? Yes, the culture equation is purpose plus strategy powered by culture, meaning it's to the culture power and that equals results. So your purpose is your why. Your strategy is your how, and your culture is the way to get results. 
What we do when we begin any engagement with a client is we start by identifying their culture equation. We're actually mm-hmm. culture agnostic. We don't have a particular culture that we're trying to get everyone to do. We're not trying to get everyone to be innovative or to get everyone to be collaborative. We're not trying to Mm -hmm. sell an angle because like I said before, everyone has different preferences. And what we're trying to do is help companies adapt their culture in response to their changing strategy and in alignment with their purpose so that there's one cohesive story about who we are and how we act, the way we think and act to get results. That's ultimately what the culture equation is. Just to make this real for somebody, can you give a simple illustration of, let me give you an example of a purpose, a strategy that would be aligned with that purpose, and then a culture that would support that. I mean, just a simple version of that, that people could make this tangible. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I did when I first invented the culture equation. It was my very first And it was a pro bono engagement I did with a board that I was on. I was on the Sacramento Philharmonic and Opera Board. And they were two organizations that had just merged, two very different cultures, the Philharmonic and the Opera. And they were both struggling financially. This merger was an attempt to save performing arts in Sacramento. And these boards merged and it was challenging. It was a clash of cultures and a clash of direction, of strategies, of purpose, And so what we had to do is we had to come up with one unified vision. Their purpose statement for the opera was to engage in the historic art of opera by blah, 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 blah. I mean, it was, I can't even remember it. It was like two sentences long. It was very (laughs) verbose and sounded good, I guess. But who knows what it was? And I don't think anyone, not even the executive director could remember it. And the same with the Philharmonic. So the first thing we do is we get very clear on our purpose. And the purpose that we came up with together was Our purpose is to engage the community in music, Mm -hmm. period. It felt true for both sides. It was clear. It was a rallying cry. Then we came up with particular strategic anchors. There were some around operational excellence. There were some around attracting a younger audience, because as you can Mm -hmm. imagine, those audiences were quite older. Part of the strategy. And then there were some about the team and merging and engaging the team at a new level so that we could operate not as silos, but as one unified effort. And then we identified metrics Key results is what we call them to know if we're winning. And those key results need to have three things. They need to be meaningful, they need to be measurable, and they need to be memorable. So they're meaningful to the purpose and the strategy. They're memorable. So everyone knows what they are and they're measurable. They are a number. Once we identified that strategy, those were all the key components of the strategy. Then we identified the cultural beliefs, the way in which people needed to act. These are not values that are timeless and never end. These are particular beliefs we need to hold in order to activate that strategy. Now, we lean on a model called the results pyramid to drive activating culture. And the results pyramid It has results at the top, appropriately named, right? That is the pinnacle. What we're trying to achieve is those results. What drives results is people's actions, right? It's the way that people act. It's what they do every day. That's what's going to either get you your results or not. Well, that's where most leaders stop and where a lot of culture efforts fail is that we think about what we need people to do and what we want to achieve. And we just go back and forth between those two things, thinking about actions like, a new technology or a new payroll system or a new training program, or we're going to reorganize the team. And all of those are action focused that maybe help in getting a result. But ultimately what we're trying to do is change the way people think and act to get results. Mm -hmm. That's the action trap, right? We need to go beneath the action trap to the thing that drives actions. So do you have a guess for the thing that drives your actions, like what drives what you do every day? So I would say I'm, I'm thinking for myself, but I also bring back the lens. If I think about employees in a company, I would say how they're rewarded. Compensation has got to be part of that. And what the company celebrates maybe as well in terms of what they're going to get recognized for just outside of compensation. So I would put, I'm guessing those are two things that, that are yeah. probably going to motivate me when I come in. Exactly. All of those things are signals for what is valued, Right. What cultural beliefs 
do we recognize? You know, what behavior do we recognize? And, and when am I compensated? It's the beliefs ultimately that we're trying mm-hmm. to foster. If I see yeah. you being transparent and transparency is value, and then I reward you for that transparency, you're now going to believe that transparency helps you get ahead and you're going to be transparent in your actions, right? Yep. So the actions we take are driven by our mindsets, the way we think, the beliefs that we have, which are all informed by exactly what you said, experiences. Leaders mm-hmm. create experiences in the rewards that they give. They create experiences in the feedback that they give. They create experiences yep. in the stories that they tell. And so those experiences drive the right beliefs. And when you get that right, you start to create sustained behavioral change. You start to get people to take action proactively rather than having to micromanage them because you're constantly focused on actions as a leader. And that is really the model that we work through with our teams to understand intentionally what beliefs need to be crafted and how to create experiences that will get you those beliefs in the hearts and minds of your employees through tools such as recognition, Mm -hmm. storytelling, feedback, and many, many more. So we give them these culture management tools that then they implement, and that's how you actually operationalize behavior change. Yeah, no, that is fascinating. And I think I'm really enjoying this conversation because it's it's, it's it's a very tangible conversation on something that traditionally is incredibly mushy. Yes. Right. Very when, you, when you talk about and I'm the answer right, very woo-woo. Woo-woo culture speaker, which is funny because <laughs> I actually at a personal level am very woo-woo, but I realize that when you're in the business world, if you want to get through to leaders, you have to speak the language of business. And this is the language right. of business. You know, yeah. it's not about being a good person. That's just a benefit. You know, when you focus yeah. on culture, you'll get the right results. And by the way, you will have done the right thing, which is an yeah. intangible benefit. Yeah. Fascinating. I'll put something on the table here. So one of the most common things I will hear related to culture when it comes to technology companies is they'll say, well, Thomas, you know, the, the main thing is we're, we're very customer centric, right? They'll put this concept on the table and then you click into it and I'll ask, I mean, well, what does that mean, right? Like, how does that, you know, you're behaving, et cetera. And as I listen to you, you know, what you're putting on the table is a paradigm here around, hey, if you are going to float the concept of being customer centric is really important back to your, you know, your purpose and your strategy and your success, then how are you in in making that action? How are you reinforcing? What does that really mean to reinforce being a customer centric, you know, company to your employees and how they behave? You need to have action around that and a strategy around that. You just can't loft this concept out there, right? And say, oh no, that's who we are. And there's no there there. I think that's a really important concept that you're putting on the table. One of the big hot buttons on culture right now that I think I was anxious to, to get your perspective on was the fact that, you know, especially in tech, we went way more virtual. And so what I see a lot of leadership teams struggling with now is this paradox or, or challenge where if you talk to employees who have been, you know, companies that are hybrid or way virtual right now, and you interview them and say, hey, do you want to come back into the audience? The majority of those employees are going to say, no, not really. I like virtual. I like the flexibility. I, I don't want to do that. But then you turn to the management teams and they are getting more and more anxious about this posture, right? And the one card they keep throwing on the table is, I'm afraid that we are losing the company culture, especially for newer and younger employees that they weren't in the office ever. They've only been virtual. And I think we're losing the culture. So what are your thoughts on that? And, and I'm sure you're talking to companies about this challenge. So how do you view this dilemma right now that's facing so many leadership teams as it relates to virtual and also what that means to culture? Yeah, I I think that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. And Mm -hmm. those companies may be losing, quote, the culture, whatever that is, and however they're defining it. But I don't think it's because they're working from home. I think it's because they don't know what the culture is or how to operationalize it. So Culture happens everywhere. Culture happens all the time. It is, as I said, with the results pyramid, the foundation of culture is the experiences that we create for each other. And those experiences lead me to hold certain beliefs that will drive my actions that are going to get the company results. And I get an experience working from home every day 
when my boss calls me or doesn't call me, when I get a text message, the emails that I receive, the Zoom calls that I go on, the retreats where we do get together on a quarterly basis, all of those create experiences that will drive beliefs in the right direction Mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. When you aren't intentional about those experiences and you're working from home and you don't know how to do that, you may lose the culture, the way that it was, because it was easier when we were within the four walls of our office place. I am not an advocate for forcing people back into the office for culture's sake. I think that's lazy leadership. I think that great leaders can create a thriving workplace culture from home. And they are right now. And those who are saying we need to get back into the office are holding on to an old playbook. That is the way that they used to do things. And they're not realizing the deep impacts that it has on the workforce to force people back into the office In the form of the growing anti-work movement that is getting louder and louder as employees feel like they're being taken advantage of. In the form of the fact that mothers are not done with the great resignation. The great resignation is ended, but not for mothers. They are still leaving the workplace in droves because they're being forced back into the office. In the form of decreased diversity in the workplace because non-white workers are less likely to take in-office jobs than white workers. So Mm -hmm. you're... Got a perfect storm of trying to get things back to the old way with a whole bunch of negative consequences with leaders who don't know how to do it differently. And that's one of the focus areas that we've been working on with our clients is educating managers and leaders on how to craft an intentional and thriving workplace culture, even when you're working from home. Our company is entirely work from home. We have an office. I think there's about one or two people who go there. Most of us, we've just started hiring outside. And what that allows us to do is have more access to better talent because we can look nationally. And it also allows us to spend more time with our families, which is a big part of our culture. And so working from home, it's here to stay. This resistance that you're seeing it from CEOs in the headlines, I will note that they are all male CEOs that are saying you have to get back into the office. I haven't seen a single mother who's advocating for getting back into the office. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Well, so this is the first time you and I've met and had dialogue on this, and we are incredibly simpatico here on some of these concepts, just some of my deep held beliefs on this. So this issue of being in the office or not, I completely agree. I mean, I think the virtual workforce is here to stay. I think there's tons of reasons why. You know, I think it's a better deal for a lot of employees. I think it's a better deal for diversity, for uh, being able to attract a talent anywhere. I believe in all of that. And I think that a management team, your term, not mine, but sort of lady, lazy leadership, that hey, the easiest thing to do, right, to get eyes on this and try to, quote, maintain our culture is to get everybody back into the four walls, right? right. That's the easiest thing to do. And I have the same intuition. I think that that's a blunt instrument. That's lazy leadership. But to put just a little bit of a color on this, though, because I think this is fair, back to your equation and your approach here, let's just say, say that you know, a key part of the culture to reinforce a strategy is brainstorming collaboration or whatever, or sharing whatever, whatever the tactic is. And it's best done when people are together for certain types of meetings or sessions. I'm just making this up, right? So you may have a use case where you say, look, for our culture and our business, et cetera, we need to have certain activities happening in person. There's no doubt you know, works it is an accelerator. It, you know, we're much more effective. There's real use cases here, and that's okay. I mean, if there's real, you know, reasons to to orchestrate that, then you should do that, right? So I don't think you and I are saying that everybody should be virtual and just get over it. I mean, but <laughs> right. But what you're saying, and and I think this is what leaders and management teams should onboard, is we've got to do the hard work here. We've got to do the hard work to say what culture activities experiences that are really important for us, right, to help reinforce our strategy, our best orchestrated face-to-face, and we're going to identify those. We'll make those happen, make the business case for those. But it's not just throw everybody in, and that's going to save our culture. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I'm culture agnostic as this culture partner. Yeah. We don't try to push a particular culture. And we have lots of clients that are all in the office, and that works for them, and it aligns with their goals. That's just not the solution to the question you asked, which is we're losing the culture, right? Whatever the culture is, it's not a solution to get people back together to get that culture back. Because what you're going to find is resentment and some toxicity and attrition. I mean, you are seeing attrition in the companies who have forced people back into the office in states. And it's not surprising me whatsoever. 
Me either. And again, I think the ship has sailed. I think that now that employees have had a taste of the flexibility, and again, I mean, we're really going down this rabbit trail, but I think it's an important one because based on where this inflection point we are in tech, of I, again, I can just see management teams saying, gosh, I think I need to pull the trigger and get everybody back in. And I think you're right. You're going to see this resentment because employees are saying, well, wait a minute. I don't have to commute into the city. I can handle my kids a lot better. I got all these benefits. And last time I checked, I'm just as productive the last two years as I was before. In fact, you just promoted me or you did whatever. And suddenly you're saying, I need to come in because why? I mean, if you, again, don't have specific use cases, compelling use cases and reason, business reasons behind it, I don't think that's going to fly with people. Yeah. It's just because. It's, I don't think it's going to fly. And there's a lot of tech companies who have already figured this out. I mean, I spent 10 years at Oracle. Oracle has been working from home this entire time. Yeah. COVID was no skin off anyone's back. I mean, they do have the Redwood Shorts headquarters and that emptied out pretty quick. But so many of the teams were virtual that it was a seamless transition. They had figured it out back in 2008 when I joined, you know. So, yeah. And, and yeah. there are other large tech organizations who have figured this out. I think the small startup organizations are going to find, listen, if you stop spending money on real estate and use that budget to get people to fly together more often and be together yep. with an intentional purpose, it's going yep. to completely have an ROI for you. Those intentional gatherings are very important now. I think people do need to meet in person. I'm not advocating for anyone to have a 100% virtual environment. I just yeah. think that we can be creative on how we create in- experiences, which are, again, the m- three most important experiences that any leader creates are recognition, feedback, mm-hmm. and storytelling. All of that happens virtually as much, if not more, than in person. Yeah. In full transparency here, I have been a virtual worker since the late 90s during the dot-com boom when labor was tight. And I was able to say, like, I'm, I'm going to go virtual. This is what I want to do. And they were so, people were so desperate for talent. They're like, don't, you know, don't quit. Don't quit. We'll let you go virtual, right? And I've done it ever since then. And, you know, I, I see it work, right? And we I've done it virtual. too. Yeah. I've never, yeah. I've only had to go into the office for my very first job, which was in London. And I absolutely hated it. And I never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. So moving on to another topic here. So you wrote this book titled Unfairly Labeled, and you have studied this issue of managing multi-generational workforces, right? So from baby boomers to millennials to Generation Z. And this also is a huge topic, right, that I see in tech because uh, we have a generation that's getting closer to retirement. We have these next generation of you know workers coming on who have very different thoughts about what's important and what motivates them and everything else. So just a little bit of insight on how to approach culture as it relates to an incredibly diverse workforce in terms of just generationally. Oh, this is my favorite topic. It's what I wrote my doctoral dissertation on. And I approached my research as a millennial with experiences in the workplace that shaped a belief that millennials were different because that's what I was told. That's what the feedback was that I was given. That's the articles that I read on Forbes and Fortune. And everyone was talking about millennials back when I was beginning the work, my work, my career. And so I wanted to identify exactly what was different about millennials and how to attract, engage and retain them. As a millennial myself, I figured I could build up some credibility in that area. Mm -hmm. What my research showed me completely blew my mind. I was so surprised to learn that the labels that we have created for each of these generations are complete nonsense. They do not house commonality. They are unconscious bias hiding in a socially acceptable generational label, which is really a mask for ageism and ultimately so counterproductive for organizations. What makes any millennial unique is not the 20 year wide age bracket that they happen to have been born within. It's a series of thousands of experiences that they had going back to the results pyramid. We all grew up having various experiences with our family, with our communities, with our church, with or no church, yeah. with our school. That shapes beliefs in our mind about what's important and what's mm-hmm right and wrong. And and that's what's going to drive our actions on whether we decide to go into tech or become a shoplifter. And that's going to get us a result. We're either going to be a software developer or we're going to be in jail, right? That's how humanity develops. And it's not these wide, wide labels. And if I were to change the labels, it becomes more obvious. I mean, we know these generations currently to be 
Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, and the baby boomers and traditionalists, maybe a couple of them are left. Larry Ellison is a traditionalist. He's still in the workforce, right? Mm -hmm. One of the common misconceptions about traditionalists is that they're terribly tech ignorant. Well, I'll let Larry Ellison know that even though he basically invented the cloud, he doesn't have any tech knowledge because that's what his generation has, right? Or me as a millennial, I'm supposed to be social media obsessed. I've never had Facebook in my life. There are so many examples, anecdotal examples, and when it really clicks with people is the people who have children that are millennials or Gen Zs, and they see Mm -hmm. how their children don't fit the mold of what they've been told about each of those generations. Yeah. If I change the label and said, okay, there's Blacks, whites, Asians, and Hispanics, what's your retention strategy for Blacks? What's your engagement strategy for Asians, right? I mean, what do you know about whites? It's just so obvious how inappropriate it is. And mm-hmm. we've made it not inappropriate and, and wrongly so. So my book yeah. was all about how they are, as it says, unfairly labeled and, and how yeah. every generation suffers from these biases. And so much of the data, if I dig into it, proves that this is just not a thing. I mean, the most obvious example is Tenure and loyalty to organizations. You hear that the younger generations are just not as loyal as the older generations and that they're fickle and they're entitled. And that's the story, right? So the Employee Benefits Research Institute measures tenure based on age. And they see that people who are 25 to 35, their average tenure is three years long. Those are the young people. Then they looked at the older people, 55 to 65 years of age, average tenure is 10 years Versus the three years for young people. So that makes it seem like young people are not as loyal. Yeah. Well, the Employee Benefits Research Institute has been doing that study for 60 years. And 60 years ago, the numbers were exactly the same, which means that the loyal baby boomers were fickle when they were 25. <laughs> right? That's not a generational issue. It's a life stage issue. When I'm 25, I think I want to sell technology and then I realize I hate it and I want to be a dancer. And so off I go to change my career. Baby boomers have figured out they're not going to get that career in dancing. And so they stay with an organization because they've been through the trials and tribulations and experiments of life. That's what we're dealing with is life stage issues that so often get narrowed down into these very simplified labels that do us no service. So as far as it goes with millennials and Gen Z, my advice to all of your listeners is pretend you never heard those terms, never repeat them again. That's not the point. If anything, it makes people feel unseen, unheard and misunderstood. And that's going to create a negative experience, which is going to create a belief that they don't get me here, which is going to lead them to take an action, which is to look elsewhere, which is going to get you a result, which is attrition. Again, I think you're putting a really, from my ears, a unique lens on this topic, and it's it's really refreshing to hear it. And I've talked to peers in the industry and friends, and your comment here about this categorization of this younger generation is different, they're not as committed, whereas I've heard all of that, right? And yet my direct experience in, in my company and in the industry in general, but like at TSIA, we've got a lot of great young people at the company. And I see work ethic that is just as strong as anything I've witnessed from people my age or older. So it's your point. It's an ageism type of argument to say, oh, by definition, just because they're of a certain age, then they operate a certain way. You're saying that's completely the wrong way to look at it. And if I play back what you put on the table much earlier, also you have to take into context the unique drivers for them. So I think about my father who worked at US Steel for 33 years and had a pension. There was a whole different economic incentive structure (laughs) that was in place that he was operating the same time, you know, in in our world where it's 401ks and you do this. It's completely different. So you can't just basically paint with these broad strokes and say, well, that's all work ethic. That's ridiculous. So yeah, super interesting. So thanks for that. And, And so I would highly recommend the concept of unfairly labeled. And I'm going to give you two more quick questions. So one is I have to ask this because you already put it on the table. You were at Oracle. I think you were there about eight years. Yeah. And Oracle, I think, is notorious, if you will. You know, they're an icon in the, in the tech industry. I've known a lot of ex-Oracle people, hard driving. Uh, it is about results. I mean, that is the reputation, right, of, of Oracle. So being there for eight years, what did that experience teach you about culture? 
everything that I know. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah, interesting. My role was uh, uh, organizational development, which is essentially a culture transformation and culture developing consultant. My clients were Oracle executives. At one point, I was hired by Sean Price. He was hired by Mark Hurd to be the head of cloud. And I did a, an engagement with him as his HR partner in the culture space. He understood culture to be so critical to driving the success of Oracle's transformation to the cloud from an on-prem company to a cloud company that he brought me on. I became his senior director of strategic planning, reporting directly into Sean Price, one person away from Mark Hurd, which was the scariest time of my life. And we were working on how we're going to get at the hearts and minds of the people in the organization to do this massive transformation because mm -hmm. it was a yeoman's effort, as I'm sure many yeoman. of your listeners will know, to yeah. go from the language of the product to the language of the customer, to go from $20 million deals to these license deals, to go. There was yeah. so much that had to change to start focusing on adoption suddenly and 24-hour yeah. service. And the customer centricity became a brand new focus area. Area. Not brand new, but it was a much more heavy focus area than it ever was before. And it meant changing everything. And there was a lot of fear in the organization from people sure. who felt like their skills were going to get them iced yeah. out. And there yeah. was a lot of excitement for people who were, you know, at Oracle and when everyone was moving to the cloud at the most exciting time in the company's history. And so understanding how different people react to those situations and creating the right experiences for them that were going to nurture the beliefs that this was something exciting that they wanted to learn and get a part of and then take the right action, which is getting on board and adapting to the new world order. That was, like I said, one of the scariest times of my career and one of the best. I ultimately left and went back to doing culture transformation, consulting, working with all of these different senior leaders, I got to work with their CMO and their COO and various GMs at the Oracle Global Business Units. I mean, everyone at Oracle is so smart, you know? I mean, that was mm -hmm. the thing that I loved. But working with all those different teams on these culture efforts showed me so much diversity in the kinds of culture. I mean, Oracle isn't one culture, you know? I mean, we've got yeah. this kind of hard driving growth oriented culture perception that is driven by Larry Ellison, Mark Hertz, Africats. And that's true sort of as an umbrella, but that wasn't the experience that everyone had because there are thousands of tiny subcultures and it was my sandbox. It was my play area. I got to play yeah. with things. I invented the culture equation while I was at Oracle because I had this client and that client. It was like I was a consultant. I mean, I was a consultant and I got to try yeah. different things. And I had 40 people that were in my role that I could steal ideas with and we could collaborate. So I am eternally grateful for my time at Oracle. And to be there during the cloud transformation was the biggest lesson now the research that we're doing with Stanford is revealing some really interesting things about the power of adaptive cultures. It's a differentiating culture above all others is the, the power to adapt your culture is going to grow your revenue more than any other type of culture. And so the fact that I've had practice with that just makes me feel mm -hmm. like I'm in the right place at the right time. And what's interesting, you were there at a time during what we called TSI the as a service transformation. So going from a traditional license on prem model to now we got to go to cloud. And you know, working with tons of tech companies on that topic, uh, you know, it is wicked hard. And culture, to your point, is a huge part of it because it is a completely different operating model. It, it, it you have to reward different things, you have to focus on different things. Like adoption is a simple thought. But it, I mean it breaks every part of the company from the way you sell to yeah. how you develop products to how you service. And so you witnessed... The teams that you have, I mean, yeah. entire teams disappear. Yeah, yeah. And so so you witnessed one of the toughest business model transformations that have ever existed in the history of tech. That's what, that's what we're witnessing here. And so that's super cool. And the other thing I observe is Oracle obviously did tons of acquisition during that. And so you talk about all these microcultures I'm sure that existed from every acquisition and how do you, you know, that has a different culture than this one over here. So yeah, that had to be like an unbelievable laboratory for you. So that's, that's pretty it was cool. wonderful. And, you know, we have a lot of tech clients now today that are going through similar things. I was just at a Absolutely. leadership retreat for a tech company. I won't name them, but that are going through that now. I mean, they're about 10 years behind the curve, right? Yep. But yep. they are doing the same thing and getting them to understand the power of the employee beliefs and driving different actions to get results is, is really the difference maker. 
Absolutely. Well, hey, this has been a great conversation. And the last question I'll ask you is, so we're going to get a chance to meet face-to-face in Las Vegas in October. We're going to be there for the conference in Vision, 16th to the 18th, and you're going to be with us. So what can the audience look forward to? Oh, we're going to have some good times. I'm going to share with you some cutting edge research that has not been revealed yet, that it's going to be ahead of its game. I'm going to give you some stories. I'm going to talk about what Oracle went through, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're going to have some interactive opportunities for people to apply some of that knowledge. And I have some goody takeaways as well. So it's going to be a good time. And by the way, you're going to be in Vegas. What can go wrong? What can go wrong? Uh, yeah, no, I, I really look forward to it. I think it's going to be a great, a great conversation. I think this this topic of culture just remains front and center for a lot of different reasons, for the as a service transformation reason, for the virtual reason, for, I mean, just a lot of reasons. And so this has been great. Today's conversation has helped tease out this reality that corporate culture does not have to be this mushy, squishy thing. In fact, it's not. It is not a mushy, squishy thing. It is acutely yeah. tangible and measurable and something that will ultimately drive you results beyond anything else that you've got access to. Your strategy is just a piece of paper until your culture puts it into action. Perfect. So I always like to end these podcasts with the question of the day. And so here it is for our audience. Is attrition rate the only metric you are tracking to assess the health of your corporate culture? Cheers, everybody. Cheers.